now that uh, uh, the motherboard uh, restoration and upgrade is complete, I turn my attention uh, to the case and the keyboard uh, of the VIC-20. Uh, this is a more, well, laborious uh, part of the process. Um, as an engineer, I am also less interested in this part, the cleaning part. There are some people online who most of what they do is uh, clean computers and, and they are very popular. So I gather that there is a lot of interest in that. Uh, but for me, that's not that much fun. I do it because it needs to be done. Keyboards accumulate a lot of dirt, a lot of junk uh, under the keycaps. So this is the right way to go about it, to remove all the keycaps with a proper keycap puller so you don't break the stems of the keys. I'm using the right tool for this. And I'm spraying now some WD-40 on all the springs that came out of the keyboard. This will clean them and protect them from future corrosion as well, since it leaves a protective, a thin protective film. Now removing all the little screws at the back of the keyboard so I get access to the PCB itself uh, and the back side of the key plungers, which actually make the contact. The shift lock key has to be disordered, as you just saw me doing. Now, these, these little contacts you see uh, on each key, these are carbon contacts. They are the ones that close the circuit that will register a key press. They are very delicate. If you rub on them, you may remove the carbon and then the key will stop working. So I'm cleaning them just with clean compressed air, just to remove the dust, uh, the, the detritus. I'm not using any contact cleaner or, or IPA uh, on the back of the keys. I'm also spraying some clean compressed air uh, on the keyboard PCB itself. This one is not as delicate, uh, but I'm being very careful because the keyboard is currently working. I don't want to do something that will make it stop working. I will rub it very gently, as you are seeing now, with a little bit of uh, contact cleaner. Uh, because it's open, it's in front of me, even though it doesn't look very dirty at all. There is no reason uh, not to do that. Now I'm finishing the job now with a little bit more of clean compressed air. Uh, so the contact cleaner, most of it evaporates, it just leaves a little thin protective film. Um, and here I'm already uh, putting uh, the, the keyboard together, not the keycaps, those will have to be washed uh, still, uh, just the rest of the structure. So it's a whole lot of little screws uh, that you have to put back together. And you also have to solder back um, the shift lock key, which has those little two terminals hanging on the lower part of the board from, from this perspective. Yeah, I had forgotten to remove the space bar, which has that little stabilization uh, wire underneath. That one also has to go under WD-40. Removing a little bit more dust, and now I'm using some uh, foams on a piece of stick. It's used in arcade uh, maintenance uh, with a little bit of IPA to clean more thoroughly in between the, the key stems. And then finally, I am resoldering the terminals for the uh, shift lock key. Now the transparent tape to secure all those wires uh, coming, out, coming out of the back of the keyboard goes back. For good measure, I put two pieces of transparent tape in there to make sure that it's really secure so it doesn't put any mechanical tension uh, on the solder joints uh, of those wires. And now to finish up in style, <laughs> a little bit of contact cleaner uh, on that connector. Mm. 
yeah, so this will remain good for another few <laughs> decades. The keycaps uh, now go into a bath <laughs> in a warm water solution with a, a floor cleaning product, which is very good at removing fat and uh, other nasties. I uh, will leave the caps uh, soaking in there for several hours before scrubbing them and uh, having them dried and put back on the keyboard. Now while the keycaps soak, I will be using compressed gas again, but in a different way. The gas in this bottle, because it is so compressed, it's at an extremely low temperature and that is helpful to remove the badges from the case in preparation for cleaning uh, and painting, which I will do later. If you give it a shake and you hold it horizontally instead of holding the can vertically, it will come out way below freezing temperature and it will basically freeze the little metal badge, causing it to contract itself very, very quickly and that will pull it uh, from the glue underneath and it will become much, much easier to just remove them. They will just pop out because they will not be so uh, attached to the glue anymore. I do it a, a couple of passes to really make sure that the metal contracts and pull itself away from the glue. Look how easily it comes off if you just uh, run uh, the knife underneath. This is the way to remove a badge without any damage. It just pops. There you go. To remove the glue residue on the case, WD-40 works very well. It's a very powerful solvent. If you spray a bit uh, on the residual glue and let it soak for, for a little while, uh, you can just uh, scrub that glue away, maybe with a a uh, flat top uh, screwdriver like I'm doing, uh, it, it works uh, fantastically. Just watch it go. And now it's the turn of the case to go under soapy water and get a good scrub. In preparation for painting, uh, my girlfriend is wet sanding uh, the case. Uh, let me tell you why I, I choose to paint a case instead of retrobrite. Number one, uh, retrobriting probably increases the brittleness of old plastics, uh, which are already very dried up, very brittle, so you actually make that worse. Uh, but even more importantly, it is not a permanent solution. Within six months, a year, a couple of years max if you're lucky, and the plastics will start yellow, yellow, yellow up again. This particular case is not very yellow, but it will be. It's a matter of time because of the bromide that is mixed in uh, with those plastics back in the 80s. It was a, a fire retardant. So if you want a permanent final solution for the yellowing problem, uh, I would advise to paint it. But if you do paint, you have to go about it in the right way. It's very important, for instance, to wet sand uh, the case to create some structure where the, the, the primer uh, can adhere to. And this is what uh, we are doing right now. We now allow it uh, to dry outside and apply the primer. It's very important to apply the correct primer. We used two thin coats of plastic primer. Once the primer is dry and fully cured, then we can start applying uh, layers uh, of paint. I'm also using plastic paint, black. Uh, the advantage of painting instead of retro brightening is that you can choose the color. I applied four thin coats of uh, paint. 
after three more coats of uh, a clear varnish uh, at the end. It's very important not to forget that if you don't apply clear varnish at the end, the paint will slowly come off on your hands as you use the computer over the years. This one is sealed in with a clear varnish. Uh, so we are putting the badges back using a general purpose uh, glue. The badges were also independently coated with a glossy uh, clear varnish um, in, in spray format. And now it's time to put it all back together again, which is very, very satisfying. And here at last is the final result. It is done. It's lovely to see it come back, coming back together like this. Uh, it has been a great experience to do this restoration. I'm very happy uh, with the end result. And look at this. It, it, it is a thing of beauty, although Commodore had uh, no sense of aesthetics whatsoever. <laughs> they were terrible as far as industrial design is concerned. I mean, look at the shape of this thing. It, it, uh, it's a complete disaster. But uh, Despite that, that's my adult self uh, uh, speaking, despite that, I love it. <laughs> I still think it's beautiful, even though it's not. 
Um, and now it's time to play with it. And uh, what I will be using is this thing here, the penultimate cartridge, which is probably a play because you know there there are so many ultimate cartridges, ultimate plus, ultimate plus plus. So this is the penultimate cartridge. Um, it's done by a smart guy in the UK, I think. Um, and it has all kinds of functions. It has a library with most software produced uh, for the, the VIC-20, at least games. There are some utilities as well. Uh, it has expanded RAM. It has an enhanced basic interpreter, all kinds of functions. But I will be using it mainly uh, to play games because that's what I remember and that's what I want to do in this machine. So you just push it here into the cartridge slot. There it is. The Ultimate cartridge connects here to the expansion bus, so from the point of view of the CPU, the 6502, or in this case the W65CO2S after the upgrade, it can see it just like it sees the basic ROM or the BIOS ROM, the basic input-output system. So from the point of the CPU, the point of view of the CPU, the expansion is just one more ROM. It's addressed via the address bus that you see here uh, in the middle of the block diagram connecting all the system components and they share data via the data bus here around which is mostly controlled uh, by the CPU. Now beyond the uh, BIOS ROM which we placed a heat sink on and basic ROM and the expansion bus where I'm connecting the, the automate cartridge there is also this character generator I believe it's just a ROM also connected to a address and data bus, that's the user RAM of the system, it's 5K, but as you saw, uh, only around 3K is available uh, to the user, in fact. I believe what's happening there is that at least, um, at least the character ROM, the contents are moved to RAM before they are used by the VIC chip, which is basically the video display processor of this architecture. And the reason I say that is because I know that in the VIC-20 you can change um, the characters uh, by using some poke uh, commands. You can create your own custom characters and therefore you cannot do that in a ROM. You can only do that in RAM that can be written to. So that's why I think uh, that information from the character generator is moved to RAM first. Uh, the video and the sound information are produced here by the VIC chip which has access to the same user RAM as the CPU, so they can communicate data that way. And then there are these two VIA chips, the versatile interface adapters, the 6522s, which we've replaced with W65C22N chips manufactured this year in 2020, and they are the interface controllers. Uh, they control the user port, the control port, where you can plug in joysticks, paddles, and a light pen. I have a joystick connected there the serial bus and the keyboard. Basically, I'm only using the keyboard uh, and the control port. So that, pretty much in a nutshell, uh, is the VIC-20 uh, architecture. And it's pretty simple to play. And that's what we are going to do right now with an enhanced S-video output on the screen, which looks just gorgeous. And uh, with some settings on the screen changed, there, are, there is no sign of jail bars anymore, you will see. And these games, they are all implemented with characters, just like in the ZX81. Instead of uh, full sprites, you define characters and you develop a game like this. And to be honest with you, I love that because it's a way to do games that uh, I, as a kid, could fully understand. And I could do it myself. I did. I programmed many games uh, using character sets or user-defined characters, especially in the Spectrum. And these are very simple games, but they have wonderful gameplay. Much superior to many of the modern games. We've forgotten it now, you know, the art of making highly playable, enjoyable, and very simple games without sophisticated graphics and, or any of that.
It starts easy, so you cannot, uh, your, your spaceship is constantly being dragged into the black hole in the center, and you have to constantly move away from it while shooting at the other ships that appear. And you cannot collide with anything. Starts fairly easy, but gets very difficult soon. Ah, what have I done? I don't know about you, but I just love the simplicity of this kind of games, as you see in the VIC-20. Um, they don't need any manual, it's obvious, very intuitive uh, what you need to do. <laughs> in this case, you are a helicopter pilot and you're trying to bomb a city through the clouds, uh, but there are all kinds of uh, uh, agents uh, trying to stop you from doing that, firing missiles from the bottom, missiles from above. Uh, there is uh, anti-aircraft uh, uh, flak and heat-seeking heat -seeking missiles. Um, it, it, and you, it's obvious once you start playing, even if you're playing for the first time, what this is all about. And okay, it's not going to keep you engaged for hours, uh, but it will certainly give you 15 minutes, 10-15 minutes of uh, simple, uh, joyful fun. <laughs> And this is Defender, a classic, one of my favorite uh, childhood games. I played countless hours uh, this game on the uh, Atari 2600 version. Uh, this VIC-20 uh, port is pretty decent, uh, fun, uh, excellent gameplay. Here is another example of an extremely simple game which is a lot of fun to play. Uh, you're controlling uh, that uh, gun in the middle and you have to shoot at the other characters that appear on all four corners uh, before they take a shot at you. Uh, but if you shoot too much, too quickly, you run out of ammunition. I mean, this requires no manual, no explanation. It's highly engaging. It will give you a few minutes of a lot of joy. And this one doesn't require an introduction. <laughs> Demon attack. I was pretty good at this when I was a kid. And I found out to my own surprise that I still am. Uh, it's like muscle memory. It's like riding a bike. You never forget. Once you are put in front of it and you are offered the controls, you know exactly what to do. <laughs> it was a lot of fun to play this one. Muscle memory from that time. <laughs> Now check out this one, <laughs> which I didn't know. Mosquito infestation. Apparently you are the owner of an arm. There there you are. And the mosquitoes come to try to yeah, suck your blood. And you have to spray some kind of insect repellent or some kind of poison on them before they manage to start sucking your blood, which would lead to all kinds of health complications. I mean, the imagination of uh, game designers uh, back in the time <laughs> is just amazing. <laughs> you have to spray a billion mothership. Now this one, Terra Guard, is hands down one of my favorite games on the VIC-20. It's wonderful gameplay, the game is dynamic, highly respons responsive, uh, it, it, it's fast, it, it, it doesn't give you a, a second of boredom. You have to destroy uh, those uh, alien ships before the big alien ship, the ship to the right uh, uh, lands and beams you up and kidnaps you. Um, that's basically the premise. Oh, there, there you go, I'm being kidnapped now because I didn't shoot them down quickly enough. Now, this is it. There is nothing more to this game. Uh, there are variations of this theme, but it, this is what it is. And you can stay engaged with this for 
quite a while, I found out. Uh, to my surprise, I still can uh, engage with this game. Um, brings back lots of memories. <laughs> This is a laser zone. You control the two cannons, and uh, yeah, the premise is very obvious. You have to shoot your enemies before they get to you, and you have to be careful not to shoot one another, not to have one cannon shoot the other, which can happen, and has happened to me several times. It's a lot of fun. In this one, you control the ship on top of the screen, and you uh, fire some uh, depth charges on the submarines below and uh, the objective of the game is to destroy the submarines without having them destroy you, as it just happened. Also a very responsive game, uh, simulates the physics, uh, of course there is nothing close to perfection, uh, but it simulates it enough uh, that, uh, that it's fun uh, to play. And notice there are no jail bars. There is not a sign of a, of a video artifacts. If you would uh, look very closely on the screen, get very close to it, you would still discern some shades that are a sign of the jail bars. Uh, but uh, unless you look for it, uh, you don't find them. So the picture quality is, uh, I could not have wished for more. I think this, is this one is Robotron 2084. It's a, a ripoff of uh, Berserk. There are several uh, uh, versions of uh, Berserk uh, for the VIC-20. This is a particularly nice one, quite colorful. <laughs> Even the sound of your gun is the berserk sound. This is a river rescue. It's a very obvious uh, reimagining of a river raid for, for the Atari 2600. Uh, it's, it plays horizontally instead of vertically, uh, but it's more or less the same idea. And it's also quite a lot of fun. River Raid is one of the best games for the for the 2600. So they they, they try to re replicate that gameplay here, and then to a large extent they they succeeded. And this is Buck Rogers, probably one of the best games uh, in the VIC-20. It's quite difficult to play, uh, but once you master it a little bit, it is a whole lot of fun. Unfortunately, I haven't mastered it quite well yet. I'm getting there. So this is it for this episode, um, I will see you again uh, in episode 6 with a, another computer, a new computer. I'm not sure yet which one it's going to be, uh, let us both be surprised. Uh, see you next time, take care, bye.